So we're going to get started with um, the panel here on do-it-yourself disruption. Thank you guys for pulling yourselves away from the coffee and the sunshine to be with us uh, this afternoon. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be interactive as well, so start to write down some of those questions. If you have a burning question, you can feel free to pipe up. It's a pretty lo uh, loud room, so we can get intimate as well. Um, so for those of you who may not know me, and I'll let um, each of our panelists sit here introduce themselves. My name is Paulina Hannon. I'm the Academy Director at Startup Health. Startup Health is a global innovation program for entrepreneurs who are transforming healthcare. We do that through a lifetime coaching program for our now 163 companies, plug them in with other like-minded entrepreneurs who are trusted, uh, peer community, give them access to the investors and partners like the folks that you see here, um, and give them a promotion engine to help them amplify their stories. So today's session is all about how do some of the larger organizations innovate internally? And how do they look at innovation um, outside of their organization? What are some of the things that they look at when they, uh, when they evaluate entrepreneurs? And for the entrepreneurs in the room, how should you be evaluating them? How should you be looking at some of the success metrics? So we'll be uh, discover, uh, discovering all of that together. So uh, by way of introduction, um, there's a lot of ways in which large corporate innovation groups do innovate. And they come in a variety of different flavors. Um, so if you guys could start out as part of introducing yourselves, um, how, do, how is your organization different from uh, others? And uh, truly, what is your objective when you look at innovation internally? To start off with, can we just get a sense for who's in the room? So how many folks are entrepreneurs? OK, great. How many of you work for a startup? Or let's start there, work for a startup. OK. How many folks are students? OK. And how many people work for like a larger organization? All right. Great. Even um, split. Sorry. Um, I'm on there saying, um, I run a program at uh, Athena Health, which for those of you who saw Jonathan, I'm not even going to try to follow how he described our company. <laughs> um, but I run a, a program at Athena called More Disruption Please, um, which is essentially our way of lowering the barriers to entry for innovators in the healthcare space to gain access to the 80,000 plus providers who use Athena every day. Uh, so we do that a few ways. One is our friends and family network. Um, I wouldn't actually call us an innovation arm. Uh, we call ourselves a, a growth program. And how we measure ourselves is if we are able to, A, help companies scale either through our marketplace, which is the equivalent of our app store, uh, where, which is a distribution channel for companies to sell into our base, um, or by helping companies scale uh, uh, through our investment. So uh, we have an investment arm where we are running, we are. Uh, making investments off of our balance sheet. Um, so we work with companies no matter where you are in the spectrum. Um, it all starts with the thesis of we're not going to be able to build the healthcare backbone by ourselves. And it's that power of the network that you heard Jonathan talk about. Um, so um, our, our goal and, and how we are different is we can invest, we can partner, um, and we are, um, I think we might touch on this later, but um, we have the ability to add competitive solutions to our marketplace. We don't get nervous about that and truly operate as an independent business unit within Athena where we are not competing with the core for resources. Great. Uh, Matt Holman, I support um, business development strategic initiatives for Cambia Direct Health Solutions. So Cambia, the parent company, um, is the parent of the Regents Group, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield plans in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Utah. Uh, about five years ago, the company reorganized into Cambia to create a broader health solutions company centered around a cause, which is we want to create great companies that make the healthcare system more consumer centric and sustainable. And so Direct Health Solutions was born out of that. And so we do um, several things. So we uh, also are not um, an innovation team per se. We actually have the innovation force within our core business, which is kind of focused on in internally facing innovation. Um, Direct Health Solutions is all about creating more external surface area um, to the market and with innovators. 
in several areas. So we have four wholly owned businesses that we've grown um, internally and we now partner out na on a national basis and so sell their services nationally. We have a, a portfolio of 18 direct investments, um, so venture style investments. And then I also help run the Cambia Grove, which we opened a year ago, which um, is our innovation hub in Seattle and um, created it kind of, I know every everyone included is trademark, but the idea of that was actually, let's create a space where we're trying to bring together entrepreneurs and enterprise on a daily basis and um, and actually inviting our competitors to the table. So we've signed on um, stakeholders from across the Northwest as anchor partners um, to participate in reverse pitches and programming, including many that we compete head to head with within the core business. And so I think that's one of the things that we're doing that's, that's very contrarian is we realize that when it comes to innovation, rising waters lifts all boats. So we don't invest just for solutions that serve our core. We also um, opened our innovation hub um, to be um, to, to bring our competitors to the, to the table to innovate with us as well. Uh, Sanjay Shah, I'm the Director of Strategic Innovation at Dignity Health. And just to give you some context, Dignity Health is 39 hospitals across three states, but 400 care sites across 21 in the U.S., 10,000 providers. Uh, and our group is the innovation site or, or hub within the system, but we've made innovation part of our culture. So there's no kind of standalone uh, physical facility or test environment because our belief is every innovation is going to take place and succeed on the clinical work line in the front row, right? Folks have to really adopt it and use it right up front. And one of the core themes for us is to make sure that as we are in the communities that many people live, and, and this is a great, I mean, everyone's here, I'm sure, enjoying a great time, but we're not an academic-based medical center. We're where everyone lives. So we have to think about partnering with healthcare companies and startups and entrepreneurial sets within larger corporations that have a mission to service all comers. And we think about Medicaid, Medicare, those who are still paying cash, and then those who have commercial pay. And the four main activities that we look at by looking across that focus represent our uh, kind of a tech transfer function. So anyone, whether you're a physician or an environmental services or security guard, you have an idea, we'll help see if there's potential to create a solution there to license it. We'll also do what we call built for purpose businesses well, when there's a problem that's really hairy, really difficult to solve, something that a startup's not going to tackle, but we think is a problem that should be worked on in healthcare, we'll, we'll work on it. And we'll partner with some startups. We'll bring them in, potentially. We'll partner with other large health systems, payers. But we'll say, we'll come up with the governance, the structure, whatever that needs to be to make something happen. And then the last two uh, options that we do are, are bodies of work, first being our open innovation platform, literally openly working with innovative early stage startup companies to bring into our care site sites, figure out how to scale them, the metrics that are going to support scale, find those executive sponsors. And if we think that that's going well because of the breadth and our, you know, the space that we support, then we'll uh, consider the role of a strategic investor. So we only invest in things that we use, but we don't, to your point, Matt, we don't invest them because they make us better. We invest because we think they make healthcare better. And then our goal as a strategic investor is to help them make healthcare better everywhere else. So it seems that there's a clearly quite um, a different breadth of the way in which you guys work with internal innovation and also external innovation. But what's common across each of, uh, each of these companies here is that you seem to have a directive um, in order to actually innovate internally um, and also to collaborate uh, with external partners or maybe even uh, sometimes your competitors. So if you were to look out maybe three years, because healthcare does uh, take a little bit of time uh, to grow and uh, um, success isn't always going to be apparent in the short term, what does success uh, look like for you three years from today if we're all sitting in the same room? Maybe Amandara and Matt, you can touch on that. Sure, so I think, um, so Athena, we made a decision um, that we weren't going to be um, a monolith in this industry, right? There's plenty of those out there. Systems that claim to be open but are actually closed. Um, solutions that say they're innovative but actually are building everything their clients want them to do. Um, um, we've, we've put out the thesis and similar to what Sanjay was saying, we, we've said we're an open platform and that is part of our culture. Um, and so you're right about the directive. Um, but it's something that we're constantly reinforcing internally, right? Is, are we actually as open as 
we want to be and what are what is in the way of us being open. Um, I think continuing that growth is really important. So we're kind of the mini startup within Athena. Um, we started the marketplace three years ago and have um, over 150 companies now selling through that marketplace. Started investing two years ago. We've made nine investments. Um, so I think for, for me, as I think about three years in the future, um, all of you should be coming to sessions like this actually knowing that that network exists. Um, and we need to take that network to the next step. So today we're creating uh, a network that serves our providers. We need to create a network that actually serves entrepreneurs to meet each other and create that symbiotic relationship that we think should exist across the continuum. Um, and we need to bring patients into the mix better. Today, our realm of influence is through the provider. Um, but as we continue our growth in population health, as we can continue our growth up market and, and patient, I very much expect um, more disruption, please, and what we're doing to be a part of that strategy where we are not only are we saying what should we add to the marketplace to help our current products, but we're actually building products where we're leaving giant holes um, that we're not building ourselves and we're going out and finding the best of breed. Um, part of that challenge is going to be getting the best of breed excited about really not sexy problems like blood banking, but we're ready to take on that challenge and we're hoping all of you will come along with us. Great. So for, for, for me, it's really three things that I think we need to move the needle on in the next um, three years. One is um, for our team, how do we help the, the core business innovate? And so for us, it would be when you look to regents, you see them as, you know, they're still a health plan, yes, but they are the most consumer oriented health plan out there and they're offering up compelling solutions and that we're able to help them architect that by bringing to the table great partners um, from a partner invest um, or, or in some cases even build perspective. From um, the por portfolio perspective, I think for us it's about really starting to scale, help provide unique advantages that help some of our investment portfolio companies scale so that, um, that we now, as a health solutions company, that the core is no longer the 800 pound gorilla in what we do, but we actually are starting to see other nodes, of other cores emerge essentially for the future. And then for the Cambia Grove, for us it's about um, harnessing those in the, the Seattle area and, and the Pacific Northwest and, and um, taking the nutrients that already exist there and creating um, a lot more activity. We want to see our region become much more of a hotbed for um, entrepreneurial activity in, in healthcare. And so um, I would hope that in three years we see double the number of um, healthcare startups in, in our region. Actually, just one yeah. opposing view, which is <laughs> at the health system level where all these startups today end up coming, I think one of our goals as health systems is to help cut the noise. And you guys do a good job of bringing the best in class available, and then we've got to figure out what sticks, right? And so coming up with whether it's the key metrics, the data, especially on the digital side, right? We're just testing stuff. And there's 800 million forms of messaging platforms out there today that will then call themselves a population health tool because that's a hot topic. But I think as we start to bubble up on activity, then it's what are the elements of success and what's going to stick. And I think that's, that's when we get to this partnership at the health system level where we start to go, how do we help support things that we think can scale, have the right mix? You guys are finding the right people, the right investors, and hopefully we're helping along with that as well. But then how do we really say this has the DNA of success? And whether it's that one company or there's other companies like it, that's a critical element. Um, over the next three years, we start to do more of that. I think it's a really good point. And just if I can yeah. add to that for a second. I think that what's so interesting about healthcare is um, I don't think Sanjay, you or your health system are you're actually representative of most of the health systems out there, <laughs> um, which is why you're here. Um, but I actually think it's an industry where we find that one of our biggest challenges to that growth is the change management of sure. having uh, not just the health systems, to your point, say we need to measure what sticks, but actually being open to this, you're not going to build the button I asked you to build right here for me. Um, and I think that it's interesting because I think from our perspective what that means, not just for our own product, but the products that we work with, is it, in, in healthcare I don't think it's skate to where the puck is going. It's like show other people where the puck is, hold hands and skate together. Um, but um, I think I appreciate the view that, that hopefully more health systems will start to think the way you guys do. And then yes, it's a building, building together towards that goal. No, absolutely. And I think that you know, my point is I think 
at the early stage, we so there's there's a little tension in between the fact that hospitals don't want to see vendor number 501 at their doorstep. Neither does a health plan. Right. And the proliferation of startups for startups' sake isn't a great thing. Yep. But we want to see continue to see more and more ideas, great ideas coming together. And then and so that's how I kind of think about the the front end of our pipeline with the Cambia Grove versus DHS and how we invest and how we work with the plan is how we begin to knit things together and create more seamless integrated consumer experiences out of the great ideas that, mm -hmm. that entrepreneurs are creating. Yeah, and you can effectively use uh, programs like the MDP uh, platform to make some of those decisions and to utilize the Cambia Grove to effectively signals of what's uh, working and what's not working out there. But Sandra, to your point in terms of what sticks, how do you uh, Dignity evaluate a company prior to even piloting it, what are some of the signals that you would use outside of them having partnered with Cambia or MDP? That sure, I mean, for, first is there's gotta be an open theme, right? So our, our goal has been to every year or 18 months continuously evolve our themes. And it doesn't mean that just because we've got a lot of activity in one, like for example, continuum of care. As a hospital company, and not wanting to just be a holding company, but an operating company, we've had to think about before someone comes into our hospital and after someone comes into one of our hospitals or care sites. And so then you start to come up with interesting partnerships and joint ventures uh, with all different types of service providers, technology providers, and, and everything in between. So if it fits a theme, great. And then when you think you've got a lot of activity, you can kind of just put less focus on that theme. It doesn't mean a theme goes away, but you start to drive them. So, you know, transportation, for example, is an interesting space. And you talk about these ugly operational themes, but there's all kinds of great information out there about one of the most difficult things to do is to get patients to where they need to be or consumers to where they need to be at the right point in time so that we can get them the services that they need in a timely fashion, an easily accessible fashion, and a highly satisfactory experience. Right? So then comes the, the other traditional venture stuff. So good team, good backing. Are they going to be around for a while? Do we think that they're going to be able to solve a problem? Um, are they coming to us by references from both folks here and elsewhere? Are there other health systems that are looking at something like this? So I think there's a lot of back channel conversations that happen prior to even engaging company um, and seeing if it's going to work out. And then the last part of this is finding executive sponsors, which is part of our role. If anything is going to live for a while in our health system, then we've got to find the folks that are going to be behind it. Right? It's going to be on their P&L. It's going to be part of their innovation or initiatives of change. And we've got to get them bought in right up front. Now, it's, um, as you're looking for some of those uh, clinical champions and some of that internal selling, is there something that entrepreneurs can also do to help you sell themselves be uh, better to your internal organizations? I, you know, one comment, you know, just to share the, share the stage on this one. But I think the first thing is to understand it's not a sale. It's an educational mm -hmm. process, right? If you can talk about data, if you can talk about outcomes, if you're talking about consumer experiences and how you're going to move net promoter scores and helping understand that it's not just about trying to close a sale because that's the one pitch that they've all heard and they all start to tune out. So if you start to translate that into an, education, an educational conversation about the impact, and probably the one thing I'd also say is don't spend too much time on validating the problem. Because if there's one thing the clinical, the, the clinical staff know, it's, it's the healthcare problem. So you can just say, do you agree? Yes, check. All right, let's skip these next five slides and go right into how we're looking at transforming how care is going to be provided. But I'm sure you guys have some thoughts as well. I, I mean, I completely agree with that. And I would even go more than, than coming with education, but thinking about it in terms of a relationship. <laughs> And so I think what's interesting for us is how little entrepreneurs sometimes invest in, in forging a relationship with the crusty old Very provider true. plan execs that they're trying to sell to as customers and, um, and, and really and or just focusing on the buyer. And so what's interesting is these big organizations um, decisions are very consensus driven. And so there may be a buyer and you understand what they want out of a solution. But then when they, they go back and make a decision, there's going to be eight people around IT, the table. And, and those people are going to yeah. have different hopes, dreams, and fears. Yeah. And the more that you can actually understand the, the broader group that's going to be sit, sitting down um, and providing counsel on a decision and, and then tailoring the discussion so that you're actually going around and, and addressing kind of each of them specifically and, and where they're coming from and their vantage point. Um, that's something that I mean, has been tremendously successful for, for the early stage companies that we've had yeah. um, pitch us. Um, I would disagree. Um, I actually think that sucks as an entrepreneur, right? That we put the onus on them to get to know, like, please get to know 
our organization, make sure you've had, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in you guys' mouth, I'm just saying what we've seen is please embrace our 300-day sales cycle. Make sure you get coffee with these eight people. Pretty optimistic. And they like you, and that's optimistic, right? <laughs> and I think, like, we, I just want to call out that I think that's really discouraging, and it's, it's unfortunate that, yes, that is absolutely what you have to do, but I don't, is that, is that the vision for how you should be selling into these systems? Hopefully not, right? Hopefully it's not relationship driven. To your point, if you don't need to prove the need and what you're doing is truly resonating, hopefully in an ideal world that would just show. That's not the world we live in. And I think it's where for us, um, the advice we give entrepreneurs is yes. If you're selling, if you just go after the whales, if you go after the health systems, you are embracing a 300 optimistic day sales cycle, which will take up a lot of your time and you might end up with a pilot that then leads to nowhere. So, but it turns out that out there, there are hundreds and thousands of providers that are running one, two, 10, 20, 50 doc practices that will take your shrink wrapped version of what you're selling them. It's a shorter sales cycle and if you're integrated, that can actually help you with your burn on a day-to-day -day basis while you chase the whale. Um, I think the other, other thing I would say is have a point of view because what we see all the time is entrepreneurs that are jaded from this, I need to understand what the health system needs from me and I want to let them customize and the only way I'm going to get this in their hands is if they tell me what they want. And again, I'm saying this in a very generalized way and not about the folks that are up here. Um, as I said, Sanjay and, and the folks up here don't represent the norm in terms of what we've seen. We want, you guys should have a point of view. Have a point of view on what you want your solution to be. And yes, take the feedback, but don't customize your solution so much for that first client or that first big contract that you end up with a solution that is good for exactly one system. Um, we see that all the time where companies come to us and say, Athena, what do you think we should do? Like, how should we integrate with your solution? How should we be part of the provider workflow? Um, and I think it's really important to have a point of view um, and make sure you bring that to the table. Those are so. Those are it's a, it's a great point, which is those are ways to cut that 300. Day, it's, it's not 300. It's 365, right? Plus, At least plus. I was, so, I was thinking in the 500s. <laughs> if you're talking the really big ones, you know. But the point being that there are certain things you can do, and one of the key things is realizing if you're going to go after health systems today, the notion of a partnership is much more valuable than just trying to close a sale for that one pilot. Mm -hmm. So think like for us, and I don't know if this structure exists everywhere, but I think more health centers are starting to do this, we actually negotiate at the master services agreement level first. We're going to go ahead and say, forget about just trying to close one pilot in one site. Let's negotiate the master service agreement level. Within that, do a statement of work. That's that first pilot. But if that first pilot goes well, then we know we already have the construct in set to just and scale this out. Second, think about what really resonates with respect to metrics. Right? How are you going to prove that your solution made an impact on cost, access, or quality. And in doing so, don't pick the metrics that take 18 to 24 months to measure, because that doesn't work for you as a startup, that doesn't work for you from an innovation perspective, a change of culture, speed, rapid, none, none of that stuff sounds like it happens in 18 to 24 months. So think about, uh, you know, our, our chief strategic innovation officer just sent, a, I think, an article on LinkedIn talking about something like micrometrics, and how do you unpack, like, avoided readmissions to things that could be trending towards avoided readmissions but are measurable within six months or less. So, so what are some of the, in, because that uh, sales cycle is so long um, and there's so many things that I'm sure entrepreneurs uh, can do better, for the uh, folks uh, here who are from large healthcare organizations, can you give some examples in terms of things that you've done internally, like um, start to negotiate at the MSA level, uh, that have removed red tape over the last couple of years and have allowed innovation to come into your organization quicker? Yeah, so I can talk about a couple of things that, that we've been doing. And again, I, I don't just support regions. We, yep. we support for a lot of different customer groups and through Cambia Grove. So Cambia Grove, we're running a reverse pitch program where we partnered with a lot of the health systems yep. regionally, CHI Franciscan, MultiCare, Evergreen Health, Overlake, pretty much um, a plurality of, of the hospital systems in the region to commit to doing um, a reverse pitch and working, doing a pilot with, with a startup. So each of them is committed to doing one pilot per year over a two-year span. And from the first pitch of their problem statement 
to a signed memorandum of understanding with them and going into implementation being less than five months, which isn't as short as a single thing, shingle practice, but to get a contract with CHI Franciscan in under five months is, is pretty amazing. And to get to a letter of intent in less than 60 days is, is pretty incredible. So that's one big thing. And then for us, when you know, doing trench warfare and getting pilots through faster internally, we think about it in terms of killing snakes. And so it's how do we work with procurement so that pro the procurement process internally isn't oriented around an RFP process that literally asks how many years have you been in business, how many customers do you have, what's your revenue, and making decisions based on that, as well as culturally, how do we, um, how do we actually instill an, you know, a culture that we, we don't just focus on the big priorities that are at the top of the list, but we're also going to, to separate some bandwidth and mind share to pilot and experimenting with little things because the pilots always fall off the list um, because you're focused on the big implementation um, and, and then having budget attached to it so that it also doesn't get starved so that you're doing paid pilots that can become you know, meaningful customer relationships versus something that's extractive. Um, I think at Athena, um, and for those of you who are growing your businesses, um, one thing that um, we acknowledge at the um, corporate, at like the C-suite level, is that there's, um, there's being an entrepreneur, and then there's being entrepreneurial. Um, and I do think that there is, that what's part of our culture is that while you, of course, you're working at, um, we call ourselves a big small company or a small big company, depending on where you're, you're sitting, but um, empowering our employees to actually be entrepreneurial, um, where taking that risk of saying, maybe we shouldn't build this, it doesn't get you um, shamed, it gets you rewarded, um, and where uh, from top down you are across the company make, making, asking the question of why are we building this versus partnering versus investing versus buying, right? And that's a discipline that is very hard, um, and it's a discipline that is hard to enforce, particularly in the core, uh, where if your product is your baby, saying someone else's baby is prettier is really, really hard. Um, but I think that, that it's part of our DNA and something that is enforced um, and something that, I mean, Jonathan is very passionate about, which we're lucky about, uh, lucky with. Um, but it, is, it has to be embedded across, to your point. It has to be embedded, embedded in how you make budgeting decisions, how people are incentivized. So wh why do you get a bonus at the end of the year? Was it to, to just keep doing what you were doing or actually look broadly? And it has to be embedded in your corporate structure and your ability to act nimbly when you make that decision. Um, so I think it's something that takes a lot of effort, but is certainly worthwhile. And then I think the other last way to fast track this is your partnership channel. So it, we believe right now we're in a point of healthcare. While there's some amazing technologies that are being developed across many industries, we're at a point of implementation. Like innovation, implementation is the new innovation right now. Like getting stuff to actually get into your facility, to get people to use it, to make those minor tweaks in workflows or to not affect workflows whatsoever. That's, the key. That's where we are today, to be honest, right? That's just that's the level set. And so if you are a partner with Startup Health, okay, great, we understand that you're building a business not for us. If you're a partner with Athena, then we know that you've already thought about implementation, or at least they've thought about implementation, and we know how to implement with Athena, so then we go, all right, that's, that's something that we can go and fast track. Or if you've gone through Canvia's program and have their support, there's a venture review, there's a venture analysis, there's a thought on your ability to impact healthcare. And so it's thinking about what are those check marks that allow the risk averse the most probably risk averse group, which is the health system way out there that's got to actually deliver direct patient care. What are those things that you can do along the way that helps just really de-risk your solution by those partnerships at the end of the day? So also for the entrepreneurs in the room, can you uh, walk us through your thought process in terms of how do you make the decision of whether you um, partner with a company, whether you commercialize and implement them, whether you invest in them, or a combination of any of those? What's the buy versus build versus partner decision? Yes, and we do a little bit of all of the above, right? So we build, buy, partner, and invest. Um, I think that the, so the point that the bias to build runs deep in big companies is a really important one. And so our team, a lot of what we're trying to do is to drive that, that um, discipline through 
of building isn't always the right answer. Yes, we're big, we have resources, we have a huge dev team that may have bandwidth. Doesn't mean that we should go and, and build it versus the perfectly great solutions that are already out there that integrate well and, and work out of the box. And so for us, um, you know, we, we are trying to only build and, and specifically build new companies versus investing in companies if we think that we have something that's secret sauce internally that, that has broad applicability. And so HealthSpark, our transparency tool, was, was homegrown and was something that you know, we knew was compelling and we knew we had relationships to other plans that we could help them as a channel partner to get out in the market really quickly. Um, you know, be, beyond that, we, we actually have more of a bias to invest and to work with um, a couple partners and to see who wins and <laughs> to follow the wisdom of crowds to some extent. Um, and to give ourselves more optionality. Another definition of build is also co-development. Mm -hmm. So you may have a concept that has a lot of good merits on, on paper or even in the technical environment, and then thinking about the health system or someone else as a partner to help you really flesh it out. And that's something where we, I would call, we call that still build for purpose, right? We're working with someone who had that vision to come up with something that if we could bring our clinical know-how the representation to, again, as Manu, you said, not create a customized solution. Like if we're going to invest in this, it's because we think invest meaning people, time, resources, IT support, integration, legal reviews, all that, that we're going to help create something that doesn't just work for us at Dignity Health, but actually works for all in healthcare. And that's a good co-development partnership, in which case you start to get into interesting, you know, what are joint ventures or equity rights or things like that, which all have their own addition to the sales cycle, I'm sure but allow you to validate a product at a scale. Like you just went from like size zero to 20 really fast because you picked a big partner who will help you scale and thought about it differently. So you can, well, again, we only invest in things that we're working with and we think are going well, we're gonna scale them, have other venture folks excited, but we don't build anything on our own unless it's something that no one's gonna to touch, but we can co-build things that really might impact healthcare across the board. And that gets really exciting because you're taking the best vision from someone else who has a healthcare inkling or really maybe really steep in healthcare, but we can get buy-in from a larger healthcare entity really quick and then hopefully impact healthcare and transform that further. Yeah, yeah, and I think any early stage investment that you partner with is going to be co-development. And is. if you say and it's not, you're fooling you, yourself, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, so the last question before I throw it out to you guys uh, in the audience for some Q&A um, is, there's going to be a lot of startups that will want to partner with you solely because you're a marquee name and that just uh, want to have the Dignity, Cambio, or Athena logo on their side presentation. Um, but how should they evaluate the quality of their partnership with you? What are some of the criteria and the metrics that they should be utilizing to maybe evaluate companies like you? Sure. Um, I, I, I'll broaden it up from Athena to just I don't want this to be like yeah. rah rah, Athena. Um, I think in general, uh, a thing that that we advise companies to do is like ask what strings are attached. So sometimes folks will take investments from corporates, uh, thinking that there are guarantees around. So like corporate arms, uh, VC arms of large health systems, for example, there are some where there is a relationship with the core. But like if if Kaiser Ventures, for example. If they make an investment with you, there is no guarantee that Kaiser Proper is ever going to sign a contract with you. And understanding that upfront before you give away your equity, I think, is really important. Um, asking what a pilot means, and, and you know, I think dignity is great in that there is a mechanism to turn that pilot into a real relationship. There's lots of relationships that don't look that way. And then do your homework. Like for most companies, they should be able to tell you other partners, other companies, other things that went really well. And or didn't go so well, and you should be able to talk to those CEOs and understand what does it mean to have this person on my board? What does it mean to have this person when I do go out and raise my big equity round? Are they gonna help me? Are they actually gonna make it tough for new investors to invest? Um, so I think a lot of, um, don't get too excited about the brand name, like don't get us wrong, we all love our brand names and that's why we work there. But um, it only works if, if, if both partners go in with a view of what that partnership looks like and it's realistic and those expectations then can pan out versus feeling like um, you thought you were gonna get one thing um, and ending up down the road with something completely different. 
I didn't answer your question, but you did. Uh, I, I, think, I think you did, and I, I would completely agree with all of that. And I think that you know, it's, at the end of the day, it really is about expectations, and then also in terms of what um, what an investor can get you in terms of you know business development um, and your go to market strategy. And so, for some of us, we have really great relationships with employers or providers or plans. And so, in terms of what your objectives are, in terms of um, you know, how you want to be selling out into the market. And so to what extent does an investor actually have a business development function? So we, as a strategic investor, we, we actually do some business development mm -hmm. for our investments. Some investors are more, you know, hands off and provide the money. And that may be actually what you want as an investor that's, you know, go, going to have a board seat, but is otherwise hands off or as an observer. And so, I mean, I think that's the big, you know, thing to, to know is that not all, especially on the strategic side, not all investors are created equally. We all operate differently and um, that's you know either works or doesn't depending on you know the, the company the stage that you're in the customer you're targeting um, and you know the, the growth ambitions that you have yeah, i mean what's the role you want us to play beyond just the customer right at the base level yes you want to sell a contract you want to have business if you're earlier on you should be asking yourself what's the role you want the health system the, the other part, the middleware partner, whatever it is that you need them to play beyond just being a, consum a consumer of your services. If you're well established, maybe that's all you need, right? It's just about scale at that point. But if you're earlier on, it's do I need their thought leadership? Do I need their clinical oversight? Do I need them to be a reference point? Um, do I need their, their view, like IT integration implementation? Is that something that's key at this point? Uh, do I need to talk through workflows with them, workflows with them and get in their clinical environment? And then the other part of for us, especially being who we are and part of our DNA, is this notion of mission. Does my mission align with them? I can't tell you how many times we've been around tables with some really exciting opportunities, but startup companies want to focus on the commercial side of the world first. And knowing who we are, I, I find it, while it's hard, it's not easy, it's very complex to find a business model that works at the Medicaid level first, but if I can make it work there, I can make it work across the board. To start somewhere on the commercial side and to try to drive it down, you end up really bare boning a product that doesn't deliver a high experience for anyone at that point. So I think just realizing, you know, who, who are you talking to and does that mission alignment fit? And there's plenty of things that could stay in the commercial world. That's fine. But thinking about who that is that you're sitting across the table with and realizing, are we going to drive value for who you are? So now going to throw it out to you guys for questions. Otherwise, I have some more. No questions, really? Shocking. Don't want to pitch your product? All right. <laughs> OK. So I have then some additional questions um, if we want to dig into that. Um, what are some of the ways in which um, you are misconstrued out there? What are some of the misconceptions that um, entrepreneurs or that uh, folks that you may uh, compete with or be in the industry with have about your organization that you want to dispel right here? Uh, competition. I think healthcare in general tends to actually be a very um, amicable space. So I, while there are competitive environments within certain geographies, it's not a world where it's really Stanford versus Kaiser versus Dignity versus Sutter because we're all trying to effectively raise all boats. So if you're trying to improve the value of care or access to care or quality, um, and if what we really love is when we're all adopting the same technology, then that means we're, we all believe in it and we're really going to make an impact. So I think the notion there is competition, but it's not as if you're trying to create something where your four walls are better than someone else's because of, I think, the space of healthcare in general as an as a industry. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the big misperception is if you're attached to a big organization that you're doing this, this innovation program um, to be extractive of startups to enrich the old core business. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can say, say very honestly, that is absolutely not the case. All three of us actually work for organizations with pretty visionary leaders who are completely passionate about blowing up the system and would love nothing more than for, at least for our core businesses, to look nothing like they do today in 10 years. And, um, and, and that's really why we do it. And that's why we mean it when we say we want to create a more consumer-centric and sustainable um, healthcare system. If we can find the next um, you know, gr great business that serves consumers better than a traditional health plan, we'll ride that train. Um, I would say two things that uh, 
we have an, an, a healthy, we like to think it's a healthy paranoia about mm -hmm. um, and are constantly trying to fight um, that we're slow, um, that, that corporates are slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have the experience of like trying to email someone you know at some company and then getting, oh, we love that idea. I'm going to introduce you to this person. And then this person, and then you get bounced around the organization, never get an answer. Um, so at Athena, we've worked really hard. My team in particular, we actually track turnaround time on inbound requests. So when you email us, I can tell you that you will get a response within 48 hours um, with a next step. Um, and we track, we have all inbound uh, come in through one place through, uh, through who can sign and who can't sign. So that, that's actually worked really well. And then the other thing um, that I think from an investment arm perspective that keeps me up at night a little bit is we've, uh, we're a new investment arm. So uh, launched it two years ago. We've made nine investments and this year we acquired two of them. Um, and so I get very nervous about companies that come and say, is that what happens to everyone you invest in? Um, the answer is no. Um, and that we do not, we don't invest in companies uh, planning to buy them um, in, you know, in, in short order, um, but we're truly investing around strategic goals um, and not, um, and, and focus on, on kind of mutual growth. So those are the two things that, um, that we stay pretty focused on. As long as we're not doing harm, there's no point in building the perfect product because it's not going to be perfect even when you think it's perfect because the second you put it in the clinical environment, something's going to break. Like our whole purpose of how we scale something is there's a, it's a process called run, run, jump. First run, we find a fantastic environment where we know it's going to succeed. We've got the folks that really want it. They've validated the problem. The IT folks are excited. You know, we already went through all the MSA process. The second run, we take it to a place where maybe we change the geography, we change the payer mix, we change the patient mix. And we obviously don't have the same clinical staff, so we don't have the same clinical We're purposely trying to break it. And if you focused on trying to build everything great for that first run, you'd be disappointed because you'd learn in the second run we're going to break it anyways. So I think if, if you've got something to the point where you can show value, you have a thesis on how metrics are going to be based, you're thinking from a partnership perspective. So you're openly saying, here are the gaps in my product, here's what I have not solved, and those are OK, and we're not going to affect patients negatively then we can create the environment within the real clinical environment to test it and prove it out. That's, that's my, my first take at it. No, I, I completely agree. I, I think you know, it goes back to that co-development point. No matter what, you're not going to be perfect out of the gate, gates. And actually, from the, the customer perspective, it's not even just run, run, jump. It's run, run, trip, fall. <laughs> be willing to get back up and run again sure. with the partner. And, so, and that's a big piece for us is changing the culture of um, a failure. I think for big organizations, they're sort of like, I mean, there is a huge risk aversion by merit of the industry that we work in. We try to do no harm. We try to protect our patients' information. And, and you know, there's kind of that paternalistic sense. But um, And so being willing to do a lot of experiments and know that some of them are going to fail miserably. Some of them are going to miss the mark a little bit and you need to adjust. And, you know, becoming really rapid at iterating with, with the partner and co-creating kind of those solutions and adjustments to the model um, is, is critical. I would say, um, and you heard it a little bit, I think, in, in what, what Sanjay and Matt shared, the minimum viable product in healthcare is way more than in most industries, right? You sure. can't build an app today, have it go out tomorrow, have it send the word yo to like 30 million people, and then like have a billion dollar valuation in two weeks. That doesn't happen in healthcare. It turns out you have to do HIPAA compliance, make sure PHI is predict protected. There are nine million hoops already. So I think um, I, would, I would press your investors on the why. Is the why that they're worried that once you already get to that minimum viable product, you're then waiting for your perfect product to put it out there? Or um, is the why the dollars? Or is the why actually, hey, it's already really hard to get a minimum viable product. Start getting feedback on it as soon as you can, because you're going to have to tweak it. And you're going to have to make those tough decisions between giant partner asked me to do it, and I really think this is what the market is asking for. Um, so start making those decisions sooner. Um, so I think it's a balance. But I think pushing back on your investors and asking the why question will help you set up the KPIs to understand whether there is that common ground. Yeah, and, and we don't largely invest in products. We invest in teams a lot of the time because because we're not specifically focused on things that plug into the health plan. And so we have a, a company that we invested in as a resilience um, training program and is now a diabetes prevention program and things like that. I mean, for we're now five years into our investment program and it, half of the companies that are still in the portfolio that were around the first two years 
have dramatically pivoted their business model. Um, but what's made them successful has been great leadership and, you know, in, in that finding customers that they can work with and refine um, their model, refine their products. Great. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. We do need to move on to the next panel, but I want to thank Mandara, Matt, and Sanjay for an excellent discussion on DIY disruption inside large organizations. Thank you all so much. Thanks.